Thank you. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Well, let me add my greetings and welcome to all the distinguished guests, my fellow speakers, the commander of the Sri Lanka Army, and all other inv invitees and military members here. My thanks as well to Lieutenant General Sinanayake for the invitation to speak at this August seminar. To my several former students among the Sri Lankan military officers of all branches, I wish to add a special hello and my continued appreciation for your hard work as you apply your education and intellect to the advancement of your services and your country. I am speaking to you principally as an academic and a civil servant uh, from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California on the west coast of the United States. While I am an employee of the United States government, I do wish to emphasize here that my comments today are my own. They do not reflect the policy or position of the university, the United States Navy, or the United States Defense Department, nor should they be construed as such. This talk, and indeed my whole perspective as both a practitioner and a scholar of homeland security, begins with the proposition that the greatest challenges, and in fact the greatest promise, in homeland security are people. People in uniform, people in government, people in the civil service, citizens, leaders, men, women, children, people. In particular, I wish to discuss the diverse effects of migration and demographic change as an overview, uh, as they affect the broader project of homeland security, as these factors are particularly relevant to the homeland security of your country and mine, as several of our speakers have already made clear today. I should probably begin by explaining very briefly homeland security as a term of art. It has a very narrow meaning and a broader meaning. The narrow meaning is, uh, refers in the United States to the Department of Homeland Security, which is a cabinet-level ministry that was stood up in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Today, nearly a quarter million employees of this ministry serve the nation in jobs that range from aviation and border security to emergency response, from cybersecurity analysis to chemical facility inspection. The U.S. Coast Guard is part of DHS. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement is part of DHS. The Emergency Response Agency is part of DHS. Now most of the component agencies within the Department of Homeland Security existed before 2001, obviously. In the wake of the terror attacks, however, these agencies and their competencies were removed from the various ministries in which they used to be home and brought together as the Department of Homeland Security for improved communication, interaction, planning, and effectiveness. Their missions in other states tend to fall to the Interior Ministry or the Home Office or several other agencies. And for this reason, I don't wish to give the impression that I am speaking particularly of the United States Department of Homeland Security. Rather, I wish to pursue the term in its broader sense, Homeland Security as it applies to that realm of borders in security, intelligence, policing, and disaster response that in my country is resolutely in civilian hands. U.S. legal and cultural precedent disfavor, disfavors a prominent military presence in domestic security, border control, or domestic intelligence. It's not even that normal to see active duty military personnel engaged in disaster response. In such other states as Sri Lanka, however, these duties routinely fall to the armed forces, which is in part how I come to be speaking to this audience today on this theme. So again, as I speak of homeland security, I mean the domestic side of national security. As we will see presently, however, and has already been alluded to in the opening remarks for this panel, even the borders in aspect of security has significant regional and international influences and aspects. So now let's turn to the topic of migration. In 2017, according to United Nations statistics, 258 million people around the world counted as migrants. Migrants are people of one nationality living in a different state. On the one hand, this figure sounds massive. It's almost the equivalent of the population of Indonesia. That's a lot of people on the move. In contrast, migrants account for just 3.4% of the world's population, but still, most credible estimates tell us 
that migrant flows are higher today than they have been since the end of World War II. And for this reason, migration forms a significant political concern. It's a major political concern in my country and other places. For one thing, the United States is the top destination nation for migration, according to the United Nations Population Division statistics. Nearly 50 million international migrants in the country uh, are in the country in 2017. That's about one in five of the migrants on the move are in the United States. Illegal migration proceeds along similar lines and similar proportions, which accounts for the current very dim view of migration in the United States. For the most part, migration to the United States owes to economics. Um, the latest trend is actually in highly skilled and highly educated migrants coming for relatively short periods of time, um, preponderantly from Asia, from China and India. This is an interesting new trend, newer trend in the United States. The United States is also the number one country for outgoing remittances. That is, money sent from legal work in one country to relatives in another country. Uh, some 56.3 billion, with a B, dollars left the United States in 2014 in the form of remittances. This sum sounds like a lot. It's a fraction of a percent of GDP, uh, but in gross numbers, it's an awful lot of money. The United States is also, just in case you were curious, the 21st ranked migrant sending country with three million outgoing migrants in 2017. In other words, for every 100 people coming into the country in 2017, six emigrated elsewhere. These statistics are the context for the discussion that you might hear within the United States on questions of migration. Now, Sri Lanka sees the opposite migration trend, with about 40,000 international migrants in the country as of last year, but a little more than 1.7 million Sri Lankans abroad. Overall, Sri Lanka is ranked 37th among sending nations of migrants. So on the one hand, Sri Lankan migrants aren't the first thing that people think about when they think about international migration. On the other hand, it's a significant portion of the population. There are, for example, nearly a half million Sri Lankans in Saudi Arabia. Presumably, many of these migrants work as household help and also as variously skilled labor, part of this trend of increasingly educated and skilled labor moving abroad. Here's some other comparisons for context. Australia is a net receiver of migrants. It's number nine uh, among the list of, migra of migration destinations, with just more than seven million migrants in the country in 2017, and about a half million Australians living as migrants elsewhere. Australia is number 16 for outgoing remittances at seven billion. It's also the number 50 receiving country of remittances at 2.3 billion. Canada is the number eight destination about 7.8 plus or minus million migrants, but it's also the 42nd sending nation with about 1.3 million Canadians leaving in 2017. Um, as a share of GDP, Canada is, is first in both sending and receiving remittances in 2014. The UK is the number five destination, uh, but also the 10th sending nation with nearly five million Britons living outside the country Partially, I expect, because of the ease of living around the EU, and Brexit may well change these numbers. India is number 12 among destination nations, with a bit more than 5 million migrants in the country. India is also the number one sending nation, with 16.5 million Indians living overseas last year, quite a few of them, as I noted, in the United States. There's a special case, well, there's probably several, but there's at least one that I'd like to mention here where national numbers become a regional or, in fact, global uh, contention, and that would be Syria, which in 2017 was the sixth largest sending nation of migrants with 6.8 million Syrians living as migrants that year. Um, the war there has displaced these people. Between 1.1 million and 1.5 million Syrians have fled through a porous border to Lebanon, for example, a country of about 4 million people. Now consider the security implications, at least the human security implications, within Lebanon, where one school child, na one, excuse me, where now one school child in three is a refugee from Syria. Millions more Syrians 
poured into Turkey and then into Europe, precipitating the rise of populist and even nativist political parties and movements throughout the European Union that have imperiled mainstream governments and possibly even the European Union itself. The specter of extremist terrorists hiding among these refugees and infiltrating the United States gave momentum to the travel ban that was finally approved by the U.S. Supreme Court in June of this year. The Syrian case, or rather the case of the Syrians, provide some important insights into migration as a security and indeed as a strategic concern in the future. The National Intelligence Council, in its Futures 2035 report, posits several trends that relate to migration in the near and medium term, several trends that are captured in the discussions and sessions in this uh, seminar. For example, climate change. As was noted, both rising seas and increasingly unpredictable weather pose special challenges for island nations. We heard already from the Honorable Prime Minister about the threats posed to Sri Lanka. Imagine what will happen when whole swathes of, for instance, Maldives are lost to the ocean water, or if another record hurricane season displaces entire coastal populations. Now you see how these trends converge. Now national measures are absolutely necessary. They tend, however, to make us regard each immigrant as a discrete, present tense case of passport and visa control at the national boundary. Perhaps some additional reporting or registration with the authorities of the receiving countries. We tend to think in terms of border security. We would speak in terms of border governance and orderly crossings or improved identity verification, biometrics, for example, better screening. Similarly, if we are thinking at the national level, we might consider the emigrants, the people leaving their home countries, as sources of remittance monies. In some states, the diaspora population looms large in policy considerations and engagement outreach, more or less well orchestrated by several governments. From a homeland security perspective, the population of nationals living abroad also might present concerns if they are, for example, being unduly politicized, either by parties in their new states of residence or as extensions of parties at home. This co concern persists about the Turkish population, naturalized or resident, in Germany, which has banned Turkish political rallies in several German cities. In some cases, we might worry about radicalization or other problematic conversions, particularly as these migrants return home. But the national perspective, while absolutely necessary, is, I would argue, not sufficient. Because we are thinking of migration, inward and outward, in one dimension, in the national dimension. And I would argue if we simply regard migration as a matter of people moving around, we miss the greater homeland and national security implications and opportunities. The fact is that migration also marks a response to broader demographic trends. On the whole, the highly industrialized nations are facing declining birth rates, in some cases drastically declining birth rates. Put another way, these states are aging. This observation holds true for all of Europe except perhaps Russia, as well as Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and even Singapore. Thus, even my characterization of most migration to the United States as economically motivated misses an important piece of context, namely what the United States or any other country gains for all of this immigration talent, labor, expertise, know-how, and everything else that the economy requires. In this sense, immigration represents a brain gain for the receiving state. And over the longer term, after the disruptions of the initial period, migration promises to fill the demographic gap. So it's a happy ending, right? Well, for the most part. There's always the question of the folks at home, so to speak, the states that these migrants have left to seek their fortunes. They may, of course, represent surplus labor, particularly young labor, that exceeds the local capacity to absorb and employ uh, at home, in which case it's a good development that these young migrants can gain some experience uh, and some know-how and make some money overseas. On the other hand, it might represent a brain drain to the extent that the sending country's economy may not be able to sustain as many young educational professionals as it creates and probably needs. The corollary to brain drain amid these same conditions is brain waste, which refers to the underemployment or undervaluing of capable educated people who find themselves without prospects for gainful work in their field of expertise. 
Think here about an engineer who, for want of work, must earn a living as a day laborer, or a computer expert who drives a taxi, not because he wants to, but because there are so few opportunities in his home country, despite a solid education. If such a person cannot or will not leave his home country in search of employment, his only other option is a job that does not use his education or skills, and at the very least, this person represents many years, perhaps even a lifetime, of lost opportunity for his home country as well as himself. And you can see again where the human security implications begin to accumulate. Trends in education and urbanization are expected to continue according to the Global Trends 2035 report, which means more and more smart, educated job seekers will be hoping to land a good job at home, but will know that they are highly employable elsewhere. Soon enough, the lost opportunities could multiply exponentially. Whole sectors could stagnate for want of new energy and ideas of educated or skilled people. Take, for example, cybersecurity. If, as the Global Trends Report posits, technology continues to spread and proliferate, cybersecurity will become an even more pressing concern. We're talking about it today for this very reason. But what if the brain power just isn't there anymore to keep the country's capability current? let alone to innovate new defenses and strategies? Who will teach the next generation of homegrown experts? And what if we can't be solved nationally? We look for regional solutions to what might be a regional problem, global solutions to what might be a global problem. There is some interesting work being done, especially in and on the ASEAN states, on the notion of brain circulation as an alternative model to the one-way flows of brain gain and brain drain. Brain circulation seeks to make the most of human capital and mobility on a regional basis, culminating in mutual recognition arrangements for seven professions, um, agreements that have been in place since 2014. The plan seeks to facilitate the happy distribution of professionals and opportunities in Southeast Asia, keeping the expertise in the region. Needless to say, by now you can tell my remarks have gone quite a ways beyond the immediate realm of the homeland, we certainly seem to have exceeded the purview of the armed forces, the police, or any other homeland security professional. I was just talking about a whole regional solution. In a way, that's my whole point. Securing the homeland is not just something the security services do to or for the civilian population that they serve. The example of migration makes this point very clear. At some level, the causes and contexts are connected, interlaced so elaborately that it seems folly to try and pick at just one aspect. Thus, science fiction biometric scanners or absolutely impermeable borders of the future will not solve the challenges of migration as they really don't speak to the causes or context of it. Rather, a human problem, a problem of and by humans, requires human insight, human expertise, and human ingenuity. As Ban Ki-moon said, migration pre presents policy challenges, but also represents an opportunity to enhance human development, promote decent work, and strengthen collaboration. All of these things can only benefit the homeland and its security. Thank you very much.